and I'm a PhD student at GMG with a specific interest in, in crisis communication and disinformation. Uh, I'm interested in the narrative techniques used to spread disinformation, how they spread and their effects on beliefs about society. And I'm co-moderating this event together with Salma. Salma, would you like to introduce yourself shortly? Yeah, sure. Uh, hello, everyone. And I'm also very glad to, to be here and co-moderate the, the webinar together with Sofia. And I'm also a PhD student at the Department of Journalism, Media and Communication at the University of Gothenburg. And, but unlike Sofia, my research interests are more into visual communication, social media and populism. And my dissertation topic focuses on the visual representation of insecurity in right wing populist communication on social media. Now that I presented myself, I get back to you, Sofia. So you uh, introduced the topic of today's webinar. Yes, thank you, Salma. Will you share the screen? Yeah, sure. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Yeah. So today's topic is Scandinavian pandemic response, as you know. And if we change the slide, uh -huh. um, Sweden, Finland, Norway and Denmark are in many ways very similar in terms of political and media system. Since the middle of the 20th century, the Nordic countries have been singled out as a special case in international politics, political science, comparative welfare state research and the political debates as the Nordic model or the Scandinavian welfare model have become a used term within research, underlining the similarities between the countries. So politically, Finland, Norway and Denmark and Sweden have very much in common. They are all rather small democracies categorized by a long tradition of parliamentary political systems based on high degree of political or popular participation. And the countries are also categorized by well developed welfare states, comparably high taxes and a huge public sector, which gives the populations free access to health care, education and yeah, other social services. So this system is often referred to as the Nordic or Scandinavian welfare model. And even if the political debate have become more polarized in recent years, at least in Sweden, political stability and historically categorized the four countries as consensus exists on basic political issues. And the political cultures have additionally been dominated by peaceful solutions to political and social conflict categorized by the basic class compromises between the trade union movement and the employers associations, for instance. And the four countries are also rather culturally similar, which we can see in, if we take the next slide. Uh, gender attitudes and employment patterns are relatively similar across the four countries. For instance, all countries rank high on gender equality indexes and on a world scale, the countries within the Nordic reg region are also unusually trusting. A high proportion of the population countries agrees with statements such as most people can be trusted and that the government can be trusted. So finally, the media system within these countries are also relatively similar. The four countries, Denmark, Finland, Norway and Sweden, have a long tradition of public service broadcasting, including strong support for public service models. And they are granted rights through legislation, and regulations with the role of supporting democratic values, national culture and language, and of serving the whole population through a broad range of programs. And importantly, uh, they all have shared the same feature of editorial freedom, meaning no interference from the state. And adding to this, we have the many years of cooperation between the Nordic public service organizations concerning co-producing and program exchange. So related to the similarities, popula populations within Finland, Norway and Sweden and Denmark also share similar news consumption habits. Historically, the populations of the Nordic countries have relied extensively on newspaper to inform themselves about the world. And while newspapers have witnessed a continuing decline, of course, all over the world in the previous years, they have a stronghold in the form of e-paper and apps within Scandinavia and online news produced by television organizations such as public service maintains a strong position. 
there is also a reluctance somewhat towards using social media as a news source uh, with around half of the population in Nordic countries stating they do not use social media for news consumption. So online news um, services provided by public service is still strong and trust in news institutions, including public service, remains rather high. However, despite the similarities that, that have been discussed here, we see differences related to both the political landscape and the media system. Um, we, despite these similarities, we see differences in the strategies adopted to tackle COVID-19. Uh, and this is what, what Selma will continue to speak about now. Exactly. Yeah. So as, as mentioned by, by Sofia, uh, basically the Nordic countries are very much alike, uh, in addition to the fact that they are geographically proximate, but they are also culturally identical. They uh, and they have many similarities in terms of political and media system, as uh, explained by Sofia. So, however, the responses are uh, in, in, in to the COVID-19 pandemic have been remarkably divergent. So if you look here, on one hand, we have uh, Denmark, Norway and, and Finland, the three uh, countries opted for, let's say, a more interventionist approach by closing their borders in the early weeks of uh, March 2020 uh, and announcing national restriction measures uh, to curb the virus. And uh, that include a mandated closure of schools, universities, uh, culture and leisure facilities. They, uh, their strategies also uh, include some form of lockdown, uh, social distancing, combined with widespread testing and tracing infection contacts. Uh, in Norway, for example, a quarantine requirement was placed on anyone arriving from Nordic uh, region. In Finland, we have an emergency act obligated, uh, obligated people over the age of 70 to essentially self-isolate and avoid social contact as much as possible. And uh, in Denmark, for example, we have gathering and events, as you can see in, uh, on, on the picture, for more than five people totally uh, banned. Uh, basically, Denmark, Finland and, and Norway chose more of a dense and hammer strategy, which basically uh, based on finding and isolating infected individuals, breaking the train of uh, the chain, uh, sorry, of spread and use, also quarantine. Now, on the other hand, uh, Sweden went for a more, let's say, liberal response to uh, the pandemic, characterized by a series of voluntary guidelines, um, or what the Swedish, let's say, authorities describe as common sense, trust-based recommendations. Uh, the Swedish strategy was about flattening the curve, not eliminating the, the spread of the virus. And that drew applying sustainable measures, uh, which could be a part of open society for a long time. Therefore, the country, uh, let's say, rejected lockdown and privileged a relaxed approach uh, that uh, relies on the citizen voluntary compliance. And if you want to put it more simply, let's say it's uh, the country did not close restaurants, bars, shops or gyms. The, the schools uh, were, uh, let's say, for those aged under 16 remain opened and mask wearing is not mandatory and public gathering of fewer than 50 people are permitted. Now, a year after the pandemic started, Sweden, uh, let's say, suffered and still suffers uh, escalating infection rate compared to its uh, three Nordic uh, neighbors. Uh, and as you can see in the graph, as of last week, uh, 25 February, uh, the number of cumulative cases has exceeded uh, half million. Uh, even more alarming and tragic is the death toll. I mean, Sweden witnessed more dead than uh, Denmark, Finland and Norway combined. Um, looking at this, uh, the stress in figures on the Swedish approach has uh, sparked, let's say, international criticism from pandemic expert to media outlets. Uh, several uh, news articles and reports uh, have described the Swedish uh, model as a failure. Um, Time magazine uh, used the word disaster, is a, is a disaster. And then we have New York Times uh, even called the Swedish approach a cautionary tale. Um, so Sweden has indeed attracted um, a huge media attention for its different approach in responding to the pandemic. But 
When we talk about differences, this also includes the way the four Nordic countries have communicated about uh, the uh, crisis, right, Sofia? Yes, of course. Uh, and therefore, we will now turn to our first speaker, Bengt Johansson, who will talk about the outlier with regards to the strategy we just we just mentioned, Sweden. Uh, Bengt is a professor in journalism and mass communication at the Department of Journalism, Media and Communication at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. His research interest is ma mainly centers around different aspects of risk and crisis communication, political communication and journalism. His publication list comprised of more than 200 titles, including journal, journal articles, monographs, edited volumes, book chapters and reports. And Bengt is currently leading and working within four different research evaluation programs on COVID-19. And before we start, I want to remind everyone that the presentation should not last longer than 10 minutes. So we will be very happy if we can stick to that. And without further ado, I'll leave the, the floor to you, Bengt. Welcome. Thank you, Sophia and Sama for the introduction. Yeah, my name is Bengt. Now we share the screen now. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Yeah, OK. Uh, then we go. Let's start. Uh, well, that's me there reading a paper full of virus. And as uh, Sophia said, I'm involved in a number of uh, research projects on the COVID-19. Uh, the one we started right now is the COVID-Inform with a number of European colleagues that you, you fund the project. Um, the lone hero or the stubborn outlier. Uh, I will return to the strategy and the why Sweden chose the strategy uh, in the end of this talk. Uh, but I would like to start with discuss crisis communication. Uh, and um, the most important channel for crisis communication during the pandemic, at least for four or five months, uh, was the press conference uh, at 2 p.m every weekday, Monday to Friday, from the beginning of March to the mid-June or something like that, uh, which becomes some sort of campfire where we gather to listen to the COVID news. We turn on the television, just like the good old days when we gather around the 7.30 news show at Public Service Television. Uh, that was the campfire then, and uh, now we had a new one to listen about what was going on in the world of pandemics. And uh, we wanted an update, we got an update about the global situation, about the Swedish situation. And it turned out to be a success. A lot of people saw these uh, broadcast, broadcasted uh, press conferences. And from the crisis communications perspective, this kind of old style ca campaigning or uh, old time uh, way of doing crisis communication or media relations became a success. Uh, but who was actually the commander in chief or the communicator in chief, more or less? Well, you can see his face in in the fire there. Uh, you thought it might would have been the prime minister Stefan Löfven, uh, leader of the government, or maybe even King Karl of Sweden. Yeah, we have a king in Sweden. If you didn't know that, uh, and they gave a speech uh, each actually during the spring, and I think uh, they gave one each uh, during the fall. Uh, and they weren't really communicator in chief. And the ministers, uh, other ministers gave press conferences about healthcare, economy, uh, other issues. And the prime minister gave a lot of interviews and so on. Uh, but still, they were not the communicator in chief. Not at all. It was this guy. The communicator in chief was Anders Tegnell, the chief epidemiologist at the public health agency, PHA. The press conferences were his stage. No politicians were in sight. And he gave us every day an update about the pandemic, the global situation and the development in Sweden, and not at least the death toll. Uh, actually, the death toll is a number that you see, still see every day, even if there's not that many press conferences anymore. We see that every day at two o'clock. So two o'clock is when we know, still know that there will be new information about the corona. Uh, this style of his rhetoric, he said, 
tvätta händerna och wash your hands. That was some of his information. Uh, but he also gave information about recommendation, uh, what to do, where to go, where not to go, and so on. And he did it in some sort of logos rhetoric style. It was rationality, numbers, more numbers, science, expertise. He's a doctor, he's a scientist. If you compare his speeches, his talk and his press conferences with the talks of the king and, and, and the prime minister, it's quite different. They re relied more on, on ethos and pathos, more about solidarity, community, we're in this together and so on. So two different styles of communicating, two different styles of rhetoric, and we got a lot of the logos talk. Did it work? Yeah, as I said, we saw the press conferences and we rallied around the flag. Those of you who don't know about the rally around the flag theory or the, the research is based on American opinion research mainly, that we've seen a spike in trust or support for the American president during uh, international conflicts of wartime, a spike which then decreases. And we've seen this kind of rally around the flag uh, globally actually, and also very strong in Sweden where the numbers the, for the uh, prime minister and the social democratic party went up but also the numbers for the public health agency and the other government agencies rose quite dramatically uh, but of course that ended to some extent uh, the support for the government and the public uh, agencies or authorities has decreased to some extent, but mainly for the government. The numbers, the trust for the public health agency and the other government uh, authorities are still very high. It's even higher now than before the pandemic. So in all, I would say that the Swedes are not that dissatisfied, despite of what uh, Salma and Sofia showed us. Uh, well, we don't, might not think that this strategy is a success, far from with 13,000 dead, but still we appreciate not having the lockdown, that most things are still open. Uh, there are more measures now than it was in the beginning, and we are a bit bored, uh, but we, I wouldn't say we, most we think that it's a total disaster, the Swedish, uh, the Swedish strategy. It's a failure, maybe, but not a total disaster. But we can discuss that later. But I want to go back to why did Sweden chose this strategy? Why did do we actually turn into this kind of more flattening the curve instead of a more strict lockdown or something like that? Uh, well, I think we have to think of two different factors. One is the Palestinian system factor that works against centralized authority in Sweden. And the other is path dependency. And there are different aspects of this political system factors. One is that the public authorities in Sweden are independent from politics, more or less. Uh, the government can't really tell the independent public authorities what to do in specific cases. They have their own authority. They can actually do not what they want, but they have large, uh, uh, large self. Uh, they can do more or less what they want, but inside some some sort of uh, frames. And we also have a very decentralized political system. In the constitution, we claim that the regions have responsibility for their own business, also the municipalities. And during the pandemic, the regions have responsibility for the health care and the municipalities for elderly care and care homes. So that also worked against a centralized authority. And the third factor is that we actually have no legislation for state of emergency in peacetime. During wartime, we do have that, but not during peacetime. So we couldn't, even if we wanted to, really have a curfew. So uh, a lot of things in Sweden, in the Swedish political system, works against this kind of uh, centralized authority and possibilities to even have a strict lockdown. Other factors like that we actually, most all of the time when we have a crisis, we let public authorities take the lead. That's a tradition. We normally do that. 
Uh, we believe that the expertise are at the, at the public authorities and they are best managed to handle the crisis. So let them take action, let them lead. And the politicians, well, they stay in the back seat. We also have, a, as Salman Sofia said, try, high trust in public authorities. So if the public authorities tell us what to do, we are a state-oriented risk culture. We believe that the government and the public authorities, they uh, want the best for us, so we do what they tell us to do. And the third one, and the last one, is that this is not the first time that we have been outliers in relation to the rest of the world. Maybe we want to be a lone hero. Maybe we want to be the rest of the world looking at us saying that Sweden, they, they, they're doing the good thing. Because in 2009, during the swine flu, we had a quite extraordinary program for a mass vaccine uh, for the whole population, which no one else had. Uh, had some bad consequences though. And also in 2015, during the so-called refugee crisis, uh, we had we welcomed more refugees than most other countries in Europe. And also during this pandemic, Sweden stands out in having this kind of more flattening the curve, uh, more liberal model for, for uh, crisis, crisis management, crisis communication. So Sweden, maybe we want to be a lone hero, but I don't think we want to be the stubborn outlier. But we can discuss more of this later on, because that's all, folks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ben, for really a very interesting uh, presentation about uh, the Swedish approach and why it is uh, a unique uh, approach in the world. So we will move now to, to the neighboring country, uh, Denmark, uh, where uh, Mark will talk about the Danish uh, case, Danish communication strategy. Uh, Dr. Mark Black Ursten is a professor of journalism at uh, Roskilde University uh, in Denmark. He is a head of journalism studies and co-founder of the Center for News Research. He is a scientific and uh, research work concentrates on media and democracy, uh, political communication, media systems theory, journalism ethics and lobbyism. His uh, most recent work has been published in Journal of Press Politics, uh, Scandinavian Political Studies and the Nordic uh, Journal of Media Studies. Um, he has also contributed to uh, several policy reports and is one of the Danish academic national partners of Reuters Institute Digital News Report, Annual Reports and Dissemination. Mark, thank you for being here and uh, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you very much and thank you for the introduction. I will share my screen and hopefully that will work. It mostly does. I hope everybody can see the screen now. Can somebody say yes? I, I, yeah, I guess I'm seeing so everybody. Yeah. So everybody is seeing it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, as Ben just said in Sweden, the press conference in Denmark always also made a remarkable return. Uh, and also like the Swedes, the Danes have regularly gathered around the television set to hear the news from the latest government press conference. Uh, the lady in the middle of this photograph is Mette Frederiksen, our uh, prime minister. And it is of course no coincidence that she is at the center of this photograph and the center of the communication because she has, like no other prime minister, at least in the Nordic countries, taken control of the Danish corona crisis communication. Uh, the subtitle here, Hope is not a strategy, is taken from an email communication from inside uh, the prime minister, the office of the prime minister, as a sort of first response to uh, things going on in the world around uh, corona, where we have taken it in Denmark as an extreme health threat and acted accordingly. First, just to set the stage, what are we talking about? A little more than a year ago, we had the first corona patient in Denmark. Since then, we've been in partial lockdown, different types of lockdown, but still, uh, still in lockdown now with some opening up and some discussion of opening up even further, but still probably in lockdown till Easter or after Easter. And as you saw in one of the other slides, we have the total number of death, death as of today of 2,374 people. 
Uh, medical personnel will tell you that the regular flu in Denmark usually kills around 1,200 people per season. So this is sort of double of what the regular flu usually uh, causes of deaths in Denmark. Recently, uh, a white paper was published that analyzed the Danish response to the pandemic. It's more than 500 pages and gives a unique insight view to the communication, the strategies and the thoughts that went into the Danish Corona strategy. It uh, has access to government emails, to the correspondence between the prime minister's office and the health authorities. And it gives us a unique behind the scene view of what went on uh, with the Danish authorities in March, February uh, last year, but also why did the Danish government choose the precise strategy that they did? And why do we still in Denmark have a debate uh, between the government minister, the prime minister and the health authorities that sometimes seems to the general audience to be out of sync with the government saying one thing and the health authorities sometimes is indicating another thing. The reason for this is at the very early stage of the pandemic, the office of the prime minister decided to take control of the Danish Corona strategy. Now, like Ben said, we have independent uh, public, uh, uh, independent political system in Denmark, an independent decent decentralized political system. Our public authorities are in on paper, at least uh, independent from from politics, but also in Denmark, we've seen a tendency towards more and more centralization within the government, not just in this government, but also in the previous two governments, more and more power have been sort of drawn back uh, to Christian's ball, to the center of Danish politics. And even though we still have regions and municipalities, more and more control have been centered uh, at the center of government. So we've seen a, a development leading to more, towards more centralization for a number of year, years now, and our current Prime Minister, Mette Frederiksen, has made it as a specific part of her government, a specific part of her politics to take back control. This is not unique for taking control over the health authorities or trying to control the health authorities. Right now, we have another debate going on in Denmark, a communication crisis that regards uh, the Minister of Defence and the Danish Defence Department where the Danish defense departments feel that the Minister of Defense have taken over all public appearances and are trying to control the public narrative on defense. Uh, so this is not just our prime minister taking more control than usual in this types of communication, but represents a government wish to take more control of the public narrative, not only uh, regarding health, but also regarding defense and regarding other important areas in Denmark. So it's part of the government strategy and they're very outspoken about it, especially the prime minister, that they want to be the ones in charge and they are the ones taking responsibility and they're the ones who have to face an election and therefore have to sort of be able to tell the Danish population why they did that. The Danish, prime, the Danish government took over or tried to take over, depending on how you want to sort of read uh, the white paper, because they mistrusted the health authorities. They thought that the Danish health authorities underestimated the possible dangers of Corona. And there was a lot of talk of Italian conditions in Denmark. The pictures from the small uh, northern towns of Italy where truck after truckload rolled in to pick up the corpses that, that couldn't be placed anywhere else in the, the small towns because all the cemeteries were already taken up with victims of the COVID-19 pandemic. This has been, these pictures were a part of the Danish news with, with all the dead Italians and it's been part of the government's narrative that we have to avoid uh, Italian conditions and this is why hope is not a strategy. We can't hope that things will be better in Denmark. We have to take the lead and make sure that things will be better in Denmark. And the white paper shows that this has led to many behind the scene crashes behind the between the government uh, and the health authorities. And these crashes almost all have to do with whether or how much or how hard you should try to hit down and try to control uh, the pandemic, how much, how harsh should the lockdown be, uh, how wide 
and those sort of measures. We know from the white paper that these are some of the things that uh, the health authorities had a more lenient uh, approach to. They were not, they did not advise to lock down this and that. They did not advise a lot of the things that the government decided to do uh, because they thought that was the right response. So this also leads to a very different type of communication from the government and the health authorities. Uh, I'm sort of putting things a bit, uh, uh, drawing up things a bit hard saying it this way, but there are remarkable differences between the way the government has chosen to communicate in their press conferences and the way uh, the, the health authorities have chosen to uh, communicate across a, a wide spectrum of, um, of media. So if we start with the government's communication, it has been very much uh, driven by a fear narrative, the fear of ending up like Italy and the fear of a meltdown in the Danish hospitals. Early on, there was a limit of 1000 patient max in intensive care units were decided. Nobody knows exactly where this number has come from. It has been questioned a lot, especially since uh, the white paper was published. But we have been acting as if a thousand patients was the max in intensive care units and if this uh, number of patients was exceeded the Danish hospital uh, Danish hospitals would have a meltdown and would be unable uh, to 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 sustain good uh, taking good care of people with COVID-19. Like Sweden we have been like Swedes we've been fed with daily statistics on the numbers of infected the number of patients in hospitals the number of patients in IC units and the number of patients in ICU units using respirators and also the daily number of dead. The government has mainly chosen to communicate via press conferences, which are not necessarily on a weekly basis, but have been very often on a weekly basis uh, with sometimes more than one press conference a week, but not just not a regular date as we saw in Sweden. If we look at the health authorities' communications, they have been more interested in guidance on how not to get sick. They have made a lot of models and talked about some of the dangers uh, of COVID-19. They've talked a lot about mutations and risks of mutations. But we know from the white paper that despite that they have uh, talked about all these models of, of how the virus is spread, they were not. They did not advise the strategy in the end that the government took. They were more interest in guiding in guiding us on how not to be sick. This is the wash your hands, the social distancing, the mask wearing and everything else has been the focus of the health authorities uh, communication. And they've been in all types of media, social media, traditional media in real life campaigns. Uh, they've been good at selecting, for instance, humor when communicating with uh, young Danes, as in most countries, the young people have had a tendency not to listen. Uh, to stay the social distancing part of the speech uh, and the health services in Denmark have had a number of campaigns trying to address young people, uh, making young people understand that this also concerned them. Uh, and the health authorities appeared in these uh, videos and most of these videos were very humorous or ironic in in the way they tried to to handle the message. Also, there's been a lot of empathy in the public communication, a lot of let's Let's stick together. We know this is boring. We know we are being we are tired of having to do this, but we still have to do this. So a lot more empathy, a lot more humor and a little less fear uh, in their forms of communications. They've also appeared at the press conferences. and sometimes they've, they've held press conferences themselves. And they are most some of the people from the Danish health authorities rank at, at top of the most of the 50 most quoted sources in Danish news media in 2020 in a recent uh, article that tried to to count all the number of sources. The coverage in the Danish news media have pretty much followed uh, the political the politicians lead. So whatever has been the agenda of the, the day from the political point of view has almost until recently been the agenda of the day in the news media. So there's been a focus on the economy on stopping the spread on the financial aid packages on unemployment and employment and recently more focus on reopening society. But pretty much the same agenda that the government have, have been um, performing and spreading has been picked up by the news media for most of the extended period of time.
since uh, last year. As we were also told in the beginning, trust is high in the Nordic countries and trust is still high in Denmark. It is somewhat declining uh, over time right now, uh, but compared to a lot of other countries, not in the Nordic countries, but outside of the, the Nordic countries, this is still uh, a high part of the Danish population that still trusts, uh, as it says here in Danish, that trusts the government and trusts the way that the government is handling the COVID-19 crisis. Recently, we have had a big political scandal in Denmark concerning dead mink. As you may know, uh, we have a lot of minks in Denmark uh, selling their fur on an international market. Uh, minks seem to be especially good at attracting the COVID-19 virus. This, case, this, this has also been the case somewhat in Sweden, in, Sweden in, the, in the Netherlands. Um, but especially in Denmark, this has become a case because we the government ordered the, that all minks should be um, exterminated due to the risk of uh, infection and mutation within the population of minks in Denmark. It then came out that the government actually didn't have the right to do this. They had the right to exterminate all the minks in farms where they were infected, but they didn't have the right to exterminate minks on farms where the minks were not yet infected, but they did still do that. They probably did that knowing that it was unconstitutional, as some people in Denmark are arguing, or at least that they were very much on the fringe of what they had the right to do. This has become a huge political scandal and a liability for, for the government, and we are waiting a lot more investigation into this, and it has put a damper on the government's um, way of handling the crisis and probably led to a more uh, inclusive communication with other political parties. We have a social democratic minority government right now in Denmark, uh, and they're probably being a little more inclusive in their debates on, uh, on COVID-19 after this scandal than they were to begin with. But we have not seen the last of the Mink scandal, that is for sure. Right now, this is uh, the last slide. Due to the Mink scandal, uh, uh, especially, and also due to the White Book, uh, we now have a much more open and critical debate on the, how the government is handling and has handled COVID-19 in Denmark. The opposition is um, warming up with more demands. We see a new type of demonstrators taking to the Danish streets. We have a newly formed group called Men in Black who uh, demonst uh, or, uh, are having demonstrations in the larger de Danish cities. They're not uh, ig ignoring the fact that we have a virus. They're not ignoring the fact that vaccines might work, but they're protesting the extent to which the government has reduced civil rights, in their opinion, uh, during the pandemic and are demonstrating for more opening up of society. Uh, the news media are running everyday critical stories, uh, mostly uh, emanating from the white paper and all the stuff the white paper has has drawn into the public uh, debate, also on the mink scandal. Um, there's more pressure also in surveys to open up, while the government to some extent still holds on to its uh, narrative of fear, but now using the fear of new virus mutations as a way to to sort of keep on there and hope is not a strategy strategy. So we still we get a lot of daily statistics on the different mutations. We have small lockdowns when we find areas with the new mutations, but so far the new mutations have not led to any large increase in the number of infected in Denmark. Sorry, Mark, we have to wrap it up that's, a little. That's the last. Yep. OK, perfect, perfect. Uh, so thank you so much, Mark, for, for an interesting presentation. And now we will travel from Denmark to Finland. Our next speaker is Jenny Lindholm. She is an assistant professor in political science within media and communication at Åbo Academy University in Finland. 
Her main research interests are crisis communication, emotions, and politics and civic technology. She, is all, she also has a strong research profile in the area of controlled laboratory experiments, focusing on the emotional and cognitive reactions of citizens, testing self-reported emotions and psychophysiological measurements. Her work has been published in Press Politics, International Journal of Information and Systems for Crisis Response and Management, and Journal of Contingencies and Crisis Management. And I'll give the word to you now, Jenny. Welcome. Thank you so much for that introduction. Yeah, I see now when I turn my camera on that this Finnish darkness is, is getting to me here, but I'll share my screen so you'll get to see my presentation instead. Yeah, so my, my field of research is, is crisis communication in a broad sense. And uh, as you heard in the introduction, I've been more and more interested in looking at the emotional response and, um, and uh, moved into the field of uh, emotion in politics and the importance of also understanding the role of emotions in political behavior. So concerning the COVID-19, so far I've studied the visual leader communication during the government's press conferences. And in, in this case, the emotional facial expressions of our prime minister, Sanna Marin, that you see here in the middle. And uh, leader communication becomes specifically important during national crisis when this climate of fear and anxiety directs citizens' attention to, to the situation and they look for motivational cues from the leaders. And I will give you some, some results from, from the study that I did and in combination also tell you a short introduction to how Finland has handled the situation. But I would say that this image that you're seeing right now is uh, it represents the, the Finnish crisis communication quite well, or at least the visual framing of the crisis that has been broadcasted. So here you see the five party leaders of the governmental parties. And uh, it's been talk of this female response to the crisis, or maybe female leader response to the crisis. And that is something that's been emphasized in the discussion, especially during spring and summer last year. But yeah, let's look at Finland's strategy and uh, the crisis communication during three different phases. So in January and February, Finland has the ve very first few cases. And in the beginning of March, the government declares a state of emergency right away. So this is the first time it happens uh, during peacetime. So I would say it's, it's quite of a shock to Finland because Finland still has very few cases when this happens. So what it means is that, as you heard in the introduction, that the schools, also the lower schools, they are closed. They move over to distance learning and culture and sports facilities are closed as well as restaurants. And there are restrictions on how many people can meet and there, those restrictions are still, still in place today. And then the next big thing is the lockdown of <clears throat> the region Usima, which is like the Helsinki area. So people cannot move in and out of the region, but you can move freely inside of the region. So it's not a lockdown in that sense. And then in June, we see that society is slowly up opening up again. Restaurants are open and overall the cases are uh, very few during the summer. So the crisis communication during the spring of 2020 is, is mostly centered around the government's press conferences. So it's the political actors that inform the people of uh, the restrictions and recommendations. And as I told you, I've studied the emotional expressions used by the prime minister. And the results show that Marine used more and more emotional expressions as we move into, into the acute phase of the crisis. So that is when the state of emergency is in place. And uh, also that the emotion expressions, they move from, from sadness to anger. So previous research have uh, identified or, or linked certain emotions to different kind of commun communication strategies. And uh, during the Finnish press conferences, uh, Marine used 
happiness, a lot of happiness and uh, a lot of anger. So these uh, strategies have been linked to, so happiness is linked to, to reassurance and uh, anger is linked to threat. And uh, these two strategies, they are also very dominant strategies, so they, they show a strong leadership. And uh, during this period, the spring of 2020, the trust in the government is very high. Over 90% of the population, population, they support the implementation of this emergency act. And the press conference that stands out the most from all the other are this one that you're seeing right now. It's a press conference for children held in April. And during this press conference, there is an especially high use of emotional expressions and also emotions such as sadness and fear that is not that present in the other press conferences. So when school starts again in, in August, September, the cases start to rise among the young adults. And uh, especially in Vasa, where my university is located, we, we become somewhat the corona capital of Finland. And as autumn moves along and this second acute phase is taking place, we see, we see this steady rise of cases and, and new recommendations. But the, the really big thing or the big difference from the crisis strategy in during spring is that the responsibility is transferred to, to regional actors. So recommendations are now given by, by re regional groups and also the crisis communication is has like moved to, to doctors or, or other medical personnel. It's not the politicians giving the information anymore. And instead of press conferences, there is more emphasis on the journalistic work. Uh, I haven't analyzed this, but my impression is that the reporting is still mostly informative. As you say, see here, this is from our local newspaper. So it's, it's not that much investigation or scrutiny of the political actors. It's, it's still very much that we're in the middle of everything happening during the autumn of 2020. So this brings us to today and uh, there are no signs of lighter restrictions yet in practice, but our prime minister has declared that operation final sprint has started now. Last week she, she said she said this during a press conference and on the 1st of March, the government in cooperation with the president of the Republic has declared a state of emergency in Finland again due to COVID-19. And you can see that in this Instagram post. However, in the days following, so really during this week, there's been a, a really loud debate on the issue since it's since the declaration hasn't been through the parliament. So it's actually not official yet. And all the crisis communication at the moment is dominated by confusion and, and contradicting statements. So there are these communication problems arising since the responsibility is split between regional actors and the government. And uh, as a conclusion, also some studies that have looked into the Finnish crisis response have found that Finland's strategy that's been to, to contain and to mitigate the strategy and also has some hesitation between suppressing and then to test and track and isolate. These strategies are really difficult to communicate to the general public in a in a clear sense. And, and also as a concluding remark, I would say that there's been very little critical voices from the opposition. So in Finland, political parties across the political spectrum has, uh, as well as other forms of, uh, as other social forms has agreed that it's the role of the state to, to you know, pull the nation together through this crisis. And uh, this could also have some explanations in geopolitics and in history. However, we have uh, local elections coming up in April, probably because they are still discussing if it should be postponed. But when it comes to trust in uh, the political parties, in the last party poll that was published yesterday, the Social Democrats, and that is the, the Prime Minister's party, is the most popular party again. Last poll before this, it was the, the Finns, which is our populist party that was in the lead, but now they are second. So I, I think we'll see a, 
a lot more of the critical voices starting to to show up again during during the campaign. But thank you for your time and I really do love emails. I'm not a professor yet, so I don't get too many of them. So please contact me if there's anything you're wondering about that we don't have time to discuss here today. Yes, thanks, now I'll see. Many thanks, thanks. to Jenny uh, for such an insightful presentation about the Finnish case. So uh, now, uh, last but not least, <laughs> Dr. Evan Ilin from Norway, um, professor at the Department of Media and Communication, University of Oslo, and co-director of uh, POLCOM, Center for the Study of Political Communication. He has over 130 publications where he applies theories of rhetoric and sociology to the study of strategic communication. He currently has two large projects on COVID-19 funded by the Norwegian Research uh, Council. Um, thank you for being here and the floor is yours. Thank you and let me try to share my screen here as well. Um... Does this work? Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Um, trust has been put to the test by the pandemic. Uh, trust between citizens, but also trust between uh, or trust towards the public health authorities and politicians. Trust in the public health authorities to do the right thing. Trust in the politicians to do the right thing, to cope with the pandemic in the quote unquote correct manner. And as mentioned, I lead two research projects looking into this specifically. Specifically, we're studying the Norwegian public health authorities and what they do in this regard, how they build trust in this situation. In these two projects, um, the leading question is really, why should anyone trust what you're saying? And to grapple with this question, we have turned to ancient rhetoric. And ancient rhetoric would pose that you could do at least three things when you want to strengthen your credibility. You could uh, demonstrate competence, uh, you could demonstrate virtue, and you could demonstrate goodwill towards your audience. And in this short presentation, I will use these three concepts to talk about how the Norwegian public health authorities have dealt with the challenge. Uh, and the first uh, strategy then is competence, to demonstrate competence. But before I go into detail about this strategy, let me take you back to March last year. This was at the most dramatic period in Norwegian history since the Second World War. A lot of uncertainties about how the pandemic should be handled. The Norwegian government chose to shut down the country shows the lockdown strategy. But still, some critics were saying this is nearly not enough. You have to isolate everyone. You have to completely seal off the country. And one of these critics was brought in to a television studio uh, and asked about this. And again, she said, we have to isolate everyone to, in order to tackle this. Uh, otherwise, horrific scenarios will be played out. People will die en masse. Now, the program leader asked, so why should we really believe you? What kind of competence do you have then? And uh, the woman in question said, well, I'm a researcher. I have a PhD. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, I have a practice. I've been practicing uh, as a medical doctor. And on top of this, I'm also, I also have a degree in economics. So listen to me, the Norwegian government is not handling this correct. Horrific scenarios will be played out if you don't listen to me. Then uh, the Norwegian public health authorities were you know, brought in by video link and these two representatives. And please note that these representatives did not question the competence of the MD in the studio. Instead, they relied on a different way of arguing. Instead, they would say that we don't believe in this suggestion. We have other ways of dealing with this. What we see, really see here is trust that is in play. What we really see here is how the rhetoric of expertise is brought into the picture. 
And in the rhetoric of expertise, the experts would typically point to, for instance, how they belong to larger networks of experts. They would try to demonstrate that they have a certain expert language to talk about this. They did, would demonstrate expert technique, pretty much like I'm doing right now by throwing this Greek phrase technique at you. But experts would also like to explain things in an expert ped with, I mean, with using expert pedagogy. And they would invite people along or the other opposite. They would say, this is mm, a tad too difficult for you to process, but still listen to us. But perhaps just as importantly, the expertise needs to be presented as a fitting response to the challenge in question. And it has to sort of have relevance to everyday life. So using this framework, we can go back to uh, this episode in this program where trust was in play and argue that, for instance, the public health authorities in this regard had the upper hand because they were able to pinpoint or point at uh, towards how they were uh, part of a larger expert instead of this sole person in the studio. How they had dealt with pandemics previously and how their expertise then would be seen as a fitting response. So the first strategy to demonstrate credibility is to demonstrate that you're an expert, uh, you have something, you have competence in this particular area. The second strategy of demonstrating uh, credibility, demonstrating trust or building towards trust would be to emphasize virtue that you're a virtuous person, that you're a virtuous organization. And typically this could be done through, for instance, transparency. We have nothing to hide. See, here, here's our data. Uh, we have nothing to hide really. So this way of demonstrating transparency or demonstrating virtue through transparency would also entail that you would admit that, well, I don't necessarily know everything. Uh, there are things here that we don't know. Of course, this vulnerability, if you like, uh, would also lead to accusation that, well, aren't you supposed to be experts? Uh, in other words, it kind of flies in the face of this previous strategy of competence. And to be sure, there were people demonstrating or arguing that uh, the Norwegian health authorities were making a mess of everything, making un creating uncertainty, creating and fear, creating a circus of fear. Fear mongering was phrases that were used in this regard, but still didn't work out that way. The third strategy um, that could be discovered is the strategy of demonstrating goodwill towards your audience. And I would argue that uh, the Norwegian public health authorities have done this in regards of, for instance, social media, inviting and tackling questions and also applying a polite and a conversational voice in doing this. In other words, they're demonstrating goodwill towards the audience. Thank you for sending us this question. This post is not among our latest and we do not have resources to follow up all the posts, but please send us your views, stuff like that. It demonstrates goodwill towards the audience. The big question is, of course, does these strategies work? Uh, does it work? And um, at least from some of the prices that have been handed to the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, uh, it appears to be working. And uh, the Norwegian Institute of Public Health have been given prices from journalists and from com communication professionals alike, being very popular for their transparency, uh, so to speak. But perhaps most importantly, uh, if you look at the surveys, uh, the surveys since the lockdown in March last year, you can see the dip here in the trust. Uh, since the lockdown in March last year, the ability of the authorities to handle the pandemic has been trusted by a large majority of Norwegians. You could see that it is above 80% through most of last year. So in other words, what I'm arguing really is that the Norwegian authorities have been using rhetorical strategies, have demonstrated competence, have demonstrated virtue, and have demonstrated goodwill towards the audience. In other words, uh, the key takeaway point here would be, I think, that rhetoric, uh, it's no longer just for liars. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Avon. Thank you. Um for uh, all of you uh, for interesting and insightful, honestly, a presentation. 
Uh, I think it's time now for uh, to open the discussion and we have certainly a lot of questions to ask you all. We will start Sophia and I with uh, addressing by addressing some questions to uh, uh, to you and uh, this is going to be the first part. Uh, hopefully 15 minutes and then uh, we will open the floor to the audience to the audience questions. I guess uh, Sophia you have already a question. Yeah, uh, thank you all for a very interesting presentation. It was very fun to listen to. And um, we have spoken about, for instance, Jenny in the Finnish case, you, ha you highlight the role of emotional expression in communication and anger and threat. Um, and, and I believe this could differ quite a lot to the factual or sort of the, I know, I, how Anders Tegnell, the front figure in the Swedish case, communicates. And Bank, do you believe that this is a difference between the Finnish and the Swedish strategy? And in what case, what consequences might this have on, on the audience? We had this rally around effect in the beginning, but now the, the trust is sloping. So maybe, yeah, there might be a difference here, Bank. What do you what do you think? Well, the, there is a big difference because um... Uh, Anders Tegnell used more of, of uh, uh, logos rationality in, in his speeches. You know, he, he didn't talk about emotions at all. He, he, almost like he had no emotions. Uh, so it's purely informing about what's going on and how to tackle this. Not talking about emotions at all. So there's a big difference. And I listened to what both Mark, Irvin and Jenny said about the difference between the Nordic countries. This is actually a big difference because even the politicians, if you don't talk about the the prime minister's speech and the king's speech, but there were so few of them, uh, they were much more emotional. But other than that, it's quite more uh, believing in rationality and also in uh, logos in, in terms of uh, persuading. And and how, what what could be now that would be just reflecting, but but what consequences do that have for for? interpretations among the audience or, or crisis communication messages and interpretation of those. Uh, I guess there could be. Well, it's hard to tell, but of course, uh, the, you didn't use fear as, as, an, uh, as a rhetoric strategy. And uh, that might also be in that been accusing of calming down people too much and there's actually people should be scared because it's a pandemic it's, it's a deadly flu so my, maybe we should be scared but but the the rhetoric from from uh, Anders Tegnell the chief uh, epidemiologist wasn't at all in scaring people now I think Eivind the one raised his hand he wants to comment on that yeah yeah thank you um I'm dying to hear from you on this bank because you mentioned that the trust levels in the Swedish public health authorities are higher than ever. Um, today I wrote up this op-ed article and started to browse for Swedish surveys and I pulled down four different surveys pointing to the opposite results. I'm looking now at the Kantar survey uh, that has been conducted consistently since, I believe, March last year. Um, in other words, I'm just wondering, what's your take on this? Talking about a public health agency? Yes. Um, yeah. and, and as you correctly said, um, the initial results were really high, 75%. Yeah. Now they're and, lower now. They're lower now. They're almost 20% lower. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So... Um, but I'm not sure about the, do you have any numbers before? Because what we measured in our project, we measured the the level of trust for uh, public authorities in general before the pandemic stroke. Uh, and then uh, we saw the spike and we saw the decrease, but it's still higher in, uh, in our survey than it was before the pandemic hit us. Really? But I'm not sure about the public health agency. I'm not sure that that many people knew about the public health agency before the pandemic. Uh, but of course, you're, you're right. There's a decrease in support for 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 the authority, but it's still rather high. It's almost 60 percent. Um, could I follow up just with the question? Um, I'm looking at this survey from Kantar Sifo, as I mentioned, and um, the Folkehälsomyndighet and the Swedish Public Health Institute has uh, at least the service that I'm looking at uh, below 60%, that is 57%, 56, 57. 
um, the last few weeks at least, months mm -hmm. actually. Uh, but then you have this other institution, MSB. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know the Swedish or the English word for MSB. The Swedish Civil Contingencies Agency. That's it, exactly. <laughs> I've been the, practicing. And they are in the area of 34, 37 mm -hmm. percent. Any views yeah. on this? No one's know what they're doing. No, it's not. It's this. It's actually they're not important in that sense. You know, people are they're, they're actually on the same press conference as uh, the public health agency. But what they're doing there, it's not that clear. They are reporting about results, about opinion polls, and so on. So I don't think people actually are really knowing what they're doing in terms of managing the crisis. I think Jenny wants to come in with a question. If that's if that's fine. Yeah, it was more of a, a clarification that, uh, or uh, what I studied was the nonverbal communication, so the, the facial expressions. And I, I think that, that it would be really interesting also to, because studies have shown that facial expressions, uh, they can be a really good predictor of uh, how people, how people evaluate the leaders. So it would be interesting to see what types of emotional expressions uh, Tegnell used during his press conferences that maybe even though you know he was talking about rationality rationality and facts maybe he was showing or of course he was showing some some types of emotions and to to combine the, the rhetorics with uh, also other types of communication forms yeah that was my comment mm -hmm. So I, I have a question for all of you I mean who feel like uh, replying to it but it's um related to um, to the fact that since the, the beginning of this pandemic, we have this kind of comparative approach towards countries who is doing handling well the crisis. And m many have assumed th that the countries with governments led by women have handled the pandemic successfully. Uh, Norway, Finland, Denmark are on the top of the list. Uh, also, we have countries like New Zealand and Taiwan. But can can we really argue that the difference in the pandemic response in the Nordic countries is really related to the gender leadership? I think it's a really interesting question because we have studies that look at gender stereotyping and uh, how we evaluate leaders and and also that that women might be if we have for instance political scandals you might it might be more uh, it might be worse for a woman to be in a political scandal so i think you know research show that we evaluate leaders differently based on on gender stereotypes so it it could be one one explanation, but probably not the whole whole picture. What do you others think? Yes, sure. Uh, Uven, you you wanted to say something, right? Yes, please. Um, I'm not sure about gender, uh, but uh, one notion that we've been playing around with lately uh, to explain the differences uh, is transparency. Uh, that is the way that you're willing to open up the black box of decisions and invite people in uh, again to, to kind of allow people to see the different scenarios that you have available and also to be transparent about the possibility that you don't have the answer. And I have banked, please arrest me on this one if you disagree, but I would argue that, uh, for instance, a figure like Anish Tegnell, uh, he relies pretty much on the Logos argumentation form, uh, but uh, it, to me at least it seems that he's not really opening up, he's not making himself vulnerable, he's not admitting that, yeah, I might be mistaken in this regard. So I think that at least is one crucial uh, factor to kind of explain uh, some of the stuff that's going on or some of the differences. Mm. Okay, I, I will move to another question that it's this time for Mark. Um, while I was preparing this webinar, I came across this uh, article written by two professors at Uros University explaining that the concept of Hugo has been a key play the key role, let's say, in fighting against the the, the coronavirus spread. Uh, to what extent do you think that holds true? I mean, for 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 those who are not really familiar with the concept, is basically uh, 
kind of feeling of coziness and well-being when you're enjoying some little let's say moments of life by staying indoor uh, indoors activities moments with family i mean correct me if i'm if i'm wrong i mean uh, but but to what extent do you think this holds true in the danish uh, context well thank you that's an that's an interesting question um i would say at periods during the last year this has probably been a very healthy coping mechanism uh also helped on by public service television uh, which have a program called singing at home together uh which uh, puts the camera in people's homes and everybody sings embarrassingly bad along uh, with the popular songs uh, it has been a gigantic success uh, properly inspired by the people singing from the balconies in in Italy and and other places where it's actually warm but it's not warm in Denmark so we can't do that so we do it inside um, and that has been probably the the thing that you could you could argue has sort of trying to bring us together in in a moment of being vaguely embarrassed by each other together and by that way strengthening the bonds of, of suffering through this pandemic together. The program is still on and is still very successful. So I would I would say that has been a popular poking, uh, coping mechanism. That's very interesting. And it sort of brings me to a, a question for you all about cultural notions or symbolism in crisis communication strategies. Can we see this in the other Scandinavian countries? Examples such as Hygge, uh, in in Denmark, or is this not not something you've discovered? Yeah, Irving. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I think looking at the rhetoric uh, around pandemics, you find some metaphors being applied uh, all the time. Uh, in in Denmark, I think it's the civil spirit. Um, in in Norway, it would be communal work. We have this dugnad metaphor, uh, basically meaning that everybody is chipping in, everybody is taking part uh, to help out in the community. And I think that has been used and misused to a great extent in in the pandemic. We have a question from uh, or Ben want to say something, right? No, I would agree that almost the same mechanism work in Sweden, that uh, it's a huge uh, emphasis on response, individual responsibility and that we all in this together and uh, we have tradition of helping each other and we know that Swedes believe, trust their government and public authorities, so we know what to do when a crisis hits us. Uh, that uh, underlies the, that we actually, we can trust the citizens with this. Okay, Sofia. Uh... Any more questions for our speakers? Uh, no, I I, uh, I don't think I had anything else. Did you have anything else, Sama? I still have one more mm -hmm. question before we uh, we move to uh, to the audience. And uh, you 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 brought this idea of narratives and the frame. So we also talk about. Uh, let's say threatening or alarming frames and uh, reassuring frame like in the case of uh, you mentioned this Jenny when we have these emotions now if you look at it because the pandemic is a global basically issue it's not just a, a Nordic uh, uh, case but it's also all over the world and now if if we look at the media coverage can we talk about kind of domestication of the issue Do, does basically media coverage uh, talk about the, the pandemic differently in, in the Nordic countries or maybe domesticated to the cultural characteristic and to the, uh, let's say, political realities of, of, uh, of each nation, let's say. It's a question for all of you who feel like answering it, just uh, go ahead. Yes, please, Mark. We can hear you. Yes, thanks. I think to some extent, the news media in Denmark have been been f sort of the rally around the flag thing that usually hits you in time of a crisis. Did also initially hit the news media, uh, and and when criticism in the news media started out, it was actually criticized a lot. The first critical stories concerning how the government handled the uh, the pandemic was met with a lot of criticism of the news media sort of meddling 
with the smaller details and finding hairs in the soup, as it's called in Denmark, looking for the mistakes so you could needle away at those in order to produce journalism. And we had at, at a period of time a, a rather lengthy discussion on whether or not the news media's role in a time of crisis was to sort of support the government in its in its task of trying to cope with the crisis or whether the traditional roles of journalists was also able to be applied at this time. And we don't see that rarely in Denmark. We have pretty much a free uh, critical press in Denmark. But in this situation, it, it's sort of the political culture, the sort of idea of of rallying around the flag spread to, to the pages of the newspapers. Yes, please, Bent. Sorry. Uh, well, the Swedish situation, we had colleagues, Marina Gachette and Thomas Sedin, just published an, uh, a report about the Swedish coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic. And it, it clearly shows that during the first part of the pandemic, we had a quite, well, the publication agency were very happy about the coverage because it actually disseminated and spread all the news they wanted and all the information they wanted. Wasn't that much uh, scrutinizing investigative reporting? There were critical voices, though. There were. But it ha until June, then you started to find real investigative reporting, especially during the fall. You found a lot of investigative reporting on the Swedish strategy and, and the choices we made. But during the first four or five months, uh, there was some sort of rally around the flag, uh, which is, of course, we normally see during a crisis. The problem here was that the crisis was so extended in time because normally you have two, three days of covering what's going on, what's happening. Let's pull out the information to everyone, push out the information to everyone, and then we could go on actually do some sort of scrutinizing and accountability work. But what do you do when you have a time frame of, of a year or maybe two years? Uh, because you still need to report about what's going on, what's happening, but you also need to do this account accountability work. And I think the journalism had some sort of problem with that uh, since this pandemic was so stretch in time. I just I just to follow up since what you said really interesting because earlier we we talk about how the frame uh, of of authorities or the uh, in charge of of managing the crisis has basically influenced citizen behaviors. Can we say also the same thing? Can this apply the same thing with the media coverage? That media coverage basically affected the way how people perceive the crisis and uh, responded to it in Sweden, for example, and also uh, in, in Denmark, Finland and Norway? Yeah, generally, I would say so, yeah. But that was such a, you know, I never, I don't think anyone have experienced this kind of media coverage of anything at all, you know, all the newspapers, all the broadcast news was only about Corona. The, the section of sports was about Corona, the section of culture was about Corona, or even the cartoons were almost about Corona. So we, we was flooded in, in, in this COVID-19 and we couldn't escape it. So of course it affected us. You, I, I find it hard now when, when I think back a year and try to remember what, what the feeling was in, in March and April. You know, it's, it's hard to remember how it really was when people are were hoarding a toilet paper and, and pasta and uh, it was empty streets everywhere. Uh, it's still, it's, it's a big difference from, from now. And it's hard to actually to recall that feeling and uh, what it was like. Yes, please, Jenny. Um. Yes, Mike on. Yeah, I, I was just thinking about um, the visual framing and the, how that's really important for uh, the effects of the audience and I would say that previously I've studied different types of, of crisis and and also their visual framing and uh, usually when you when you see crisis images they, they can be kind of uh, you know scary or or um, you know it's a crisis but I think at least in Finland and maybe due to the low low cases and not that many deaths the the visual images are you know it's 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 Sanna Marin or it's a doctor or something like that. It's not these, uh, it's not these really hard images. And I heard a presentation of the US coverage and I think there the visual framing has been more uh, crisis-like, you know. I don't know what, what the, the visual framing has been in, in the other Nordic countries, but at least in Finland, I, I wouldn't say it's, it's not a severe 
crisis that you encounter when you look at the images that has been broadcasted? Okay, I think now it's time for us to uh, open um, yeah, open uh, the floor for the audience to ask questions. Thank you so much. And we already uh, start yeah, uh, uh, having yeah, people interested to ask questions. Um, I think let's start uh, with uh, Audra. Yes, please. Ah, and I remember to unmute. Beautiful. Um, so thank you all for the presentations. I think that it it is really illuminating for us um, outside of Scandinavia and, and actually in looking for some of the common themes across the presentations, there are two points that I found really interesting. First was that the amount of trust that it seems like all countries in Scandinavia, uh, or the levels of trust in the government that all the countries across Scandinavia enjoy, that's certainly something I think we'd probably all like beyond. But the second was the daily press conferences. So in, in thinking about this and looking around the world at the regions or the countries whose leaders have communicated well, like New Zealand, Scotland, even the state of New York, in comparison to, say, the rest of the U.S., they all seem to experience higher levels of trust in their government responses, perceptions of transparency. So do you guys think that a critical lesson learned from the pandemic in general is that people need their le leaders to be visible and communicative? communicative? creating this transparent and also uh, like Bank was talking about the fireside chat kind of experience so that we have something to cling on to. Uh, Eileen, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, um, I raised this point about the importance of transparency, and that is certainly something that has been important in my home country of Norway. But I think you could see the same going on elsewhere, uh, like New Zealand, you mentioned, Audra, um, and uh, yeah, elsewhere as well. But I just want to throw this in as well, because uh, the Norwegian public health authorities and the government have held weekly press conferences. And quite recently, uh, these press conferences, this way of communicating has come under attack for being a tad too strategic. That is, uh, the journalists are saying we're presented with a lot of stuff uh, over the over the desk, so to speak, um, and uh, we don't have time to process it thoroughly. So the politicians are kind of using this to avoid the critical questions. And I found that a really interesting thing to look closer at. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. You wanted to to comment that question as well. Yes, please. I would I would say sort of the same thing as as I mean, depending on when in time we look at the press conferences. To begin at the beginning, they were remarkably successful uh, because they are such a controlled event. Still, uh, beside our prime minister, a lot of other uh, authorities showed up. So it, it it was a sort of a common sense making moment where everybody got to participate in the conversation, listening to both the health authorities and the different kinds of ministries, sometimes talking together uh, to each other, sometimes talking to us as the audience and with limited amount of time for questions for the reporters. So, so to begin with, it did seem like we had sort of a, a, a common conversation by proxy because all the authorities were there together. Lately, we've had a lot of cases with, with reporters uh, complaining that when we have a press conference, the prime minister says, you can ask a question at the press conference. Then at the press conference, she cuts the press conference short so the questions won't be asked. So it's probably become more strategic as the pandemic has gone on. Thank you so much. We also have a question from um, Emma here in the audience. Uh, you are welcome to go ahead with your question. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Thank you, first of all, for all the presentations. I'm I'm also a PhD student. I'm studying now. Um, I'm I'm doing a study comparative again between uh, Israel, Germany, and the USA. The way they communicated the crisis in the first months, actually. Um, and I've already noticed a bit when looking at other communication uh, systems, uh, also in uh, Sweden a bit I looked, um, I noticed already this kind of, I would say, patriotism, what you called gather around the flag. And I was so uh, 
amazed how uh, immediately I accepted this kind of patriotism, whereas I don't accept it in other countries. And I would like to ask you, how would you define somehow, or do you have an experience to define what is actually the difference here? Why do we, you know, from the academy left uh, leaning usually perspectives, uh, tend to accept this kind of patriotism and not other, you know, other kind of patriotism in more authoritarian countries, for example. But actually, I would like more to take maybe from this question another, like, more important question that I would like to ask you. How would you recommend other countries, which are not Scandinavian, um, in the future, from this experience now, to deal with future crises? because we are going to have probably a lot related to climate change, maybe further pandemics are, you know, knocking at the door. So what would you actually recommend to do? And maybe it's related to this patriotism, but perhaps not. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, Avin. Did you want to? Yeah, please. Well, mm -hmm. I'm uh, I'm not flying the Norwegian flag. I'm flying the flag for transparency um, again. Um, I think opening up, being transparent about uh, possible scenarios, being transparent about uh, uncertainties, I think that is really the key. And uh, from our field work, uh, looking at the Norwegian public health authorities, they have been cultivating this, this openness culture, this transparency culture for years. So uh, employees in the Norwegian Public Health Institute, they're allowed to disagree, uh, they're allowed to talk in the media as, as individual researchers and I think that type of uh, ability to show that there are um, we lost you I there event um, okay we, should we uh, okay ah. we lost you for a little bit I think you your internet it, connection might be I'm my partner came home right now, so I moved to another room with a poor internet connection. But, <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, okay, uh, can you hear me better? We hear you now. Good. Yeah. Uh, well, I've, again, I think um, not talking about uh, the Norwegian flag, but the flag of, of transparency. I think that is really important here, uh, that you have to show uh, how you're not certain about everything. Um, so I think we can pull out some principles like that and use them in future pandemics because future pandemics will come. Thanks. Thank you, Evind. Uh, Bengt? Do you want to comment on this question as well? Yeah, I can agree with Irvin about transparency. And I was also want to add that uh, even if Tegnell, the Swedish chief epidemiologist, he was actually very accessible for media. He's been been have been doing numerous of interviews, uh, both at press conference and also afterwards. And he's been in the media for a year now, uh, totally exhausted probably. Uh, so he's been actually really available. But what's might be missing in a Swedish uh, crisis communication is that they're not really providing their, how they actually come up with this conclusion about the strategy. Then we could be more open about we chose about uh, to do this or do that. And by based on what we know, we chose this strategy. They could be more open about the scenarios they actually were using. I think that was some kind of mistake maybe they did in, in the beginning. They, they could actually be more open about that. But I think also it's harder for politicians to be uh, uh, saying that they are not know what to do or they're uncertain because they want to be strong, which want to show strong leadership. So maybe it's easier if not the politicians commu communicate this kind of uncertainty. And um, uh, but it both depends on it comes back to the question about gender, gender there. Can female politicians uh, use different kind of rhetoric than male? politicians, depending on what we expect from them. Over and out. I think yeah. we have a, yeah, Mark wants to comment on the, on it, right? 
just just briefly to support the idea of transparency, because even though our prime minister was very much interested in showing leadership and control in the end right now, she's going to be spending a lot of time time defending that she was not transparent about the basis of her leadership and the arguments behind the, the some of sort of extreme measures that she has taken. So in the end, it's more favorable for a politician to 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 be more honest about the decisions, but that's the same almost in all crisis communication and in political communications. And politicians seem to um, to make the same mistakes over and over again. But an advice would be more transparency and perhaps less less firm leadership. Okay, we we have a question from Florian. Florian, yes. Florian, <laughs> hi. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for the intriguing discussion. Um, there is um, a point that I would like to raise uh, from from the German perspective, and I would love to hear what uh, the um, perspective is from from the Nordic countries on that issue, and if you have shared uh, similar experiences. Um, uh, during the summer, we had very low uh, coronavirus numbers, uh, and the German discussion. Um, was really going like there will be no second lockdown, uh, it's not going to happen uh, and probably they were very confident because of the effective uh, pandemic response in, during the first lockdown that they had the virus under control, but it turned out they had not. And I would say that the political crisis communication, also the media debate, um, kind of framed the development of the crisis in a way that a second lockdown would not be uh, uh, necessary, would not even be thinkable. And now we are under a lockdown uh, for about four months, a second lockdown. Uh, so I, I really wonder um, if this state of denial that we have experienced in Germany was also uh, to be found in, in, in the countries that you uh, have been uh, sp uh, spoken about. So maybe you can share your experiences here. Thank you. Yes, uh, please, uh, Bent, go ahead. Yeah, actually, we didn't think the second wave would hit us that hard because we had a first really bad first wave and believe that now it's over for Sweden and now the rest of the world will have their waves. Uh, so we were quite surprised when we were hit by the second wave, even if we had the stories about the Spanish flu with the very severe second wave and so on. Uh, but Swedish society more or less opened up in November, in October and the start of November, uh, allowing people to, to visit venues and so on. And then, bam, lockdown again. Uh, just believing first that it would be some sort of cluster spread of the virus, but not, nothing serious. And then a week later, everything collapsed. The same denial in Sweden. Yes, we have Jenny. She wants to comment on it. Yeah, I would. The Finnish experience is similar. That that when when summer came and uh, the politicians were talking about how to open up society, how to get back to to normal, and uh, but I think at the same time everybody was uh, sort of expecting that th there could be a second wave. But what we see now in Finland is, as I told you, the operation final sprint uh, has gotten a lot of critique. That how can how can the prime minister now be be so sure that we're we only need three weeks of uh, the emergency act and then everything will be fine and everybody will be vaccinated and so on. So I think I think it's really difficult now during this spring to to have the same approach to say that we'll soon be be out of it because because nobody really knows how it will go. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we have uh, Mark. Please Pretty ahead. much this, the same experience in Denmark. We also opened up in, in the summer and everybody thought that, oh, now we're almost back to normal. Uh, they opened up the nightlife restaurants and bars uh, before they opened up schools, which everybody thought was sort of interesting, but in a way uh, also perhaps very Danish. Um, we do like beer and alcohol in Denmark and partying. Uh, and then they had to to regress, and from from late December, and and they had we had to go into a further lockdown. But there's no there's been no public backlash, because everybody needed to breathe. So I think everybody has just been happy that they had some months where they weren't in complete lockdown, 
It's all to <gasps> take a breath and then go into lockdown again. Yes, yeah, thank you, Mark. Uh, Florian, do you not do you, do you want to add anything? Oh uh, well, no, uh, I'm fine. Thank you very much for your responses. It's um, it's interesting to hear that we share similar experiences. Um, uh, and uh, I don't know if it's an encouraging or disappointing, but uh, in, in, in any case, um, it's really interesting to know. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from uh, Albena. I'm sorry, I might pronounce that wrong, but you're welcome to, to pose your question. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I'm uh, uh, participating from Switzerland. I'm uh, Swedish, but I, I live and uh, work in uh, Switzerland and um, uh, in the area of crisis communication. Um, and what is uh, very interesting in this crisis, it is uh, really a global one. And on the other side, we have a global media uh, and information that is available everywhere. And um, what we have been encountering uh, here in Switzerland, you know, Switzerland speaks three languages. And we have a very strong influence by the German media, uh, the German information, the information from our neighbors in France and Italy. And of course, uh, we were following uh, everything happening and how the authorities especially were reacting there. And I was wondering, of course, um, how uh, did the Nordic governments and the Nordic uh, media handle uh, this information about what is happening abroad, um, especially if you have uh, lockdown in Germany and no lockdown in Sweden, or uh, even the neighboring countries, we have very uh, strong measures, or how can I say, not strong measures, but very limiting measures in Norway and uh, other measures in uh, Finland, and the people, the audience is talking about. And that was uh, wondering how did the government uh, manage this maybe opposite opinions to their own strategy and uh, how did how much space the media uh, gave to them thank you perfect then i think thank you for the question and and i think even this is eager to to comment on it yeah, because um, I think uh, at least in Norway, it was quickly turned into the Scandinavian championship of Corona. So uh, we're always eager to beat the Swedes. Um, and, you know, it's in a less joking way, um, people have been comparing or journalists have been comparing what is going on in Sweden and how does it compare to the Norwegian strategy and held that up as a benchmark of, oh, this is not the way we would like to handle it. Look at those death tolls. So, and that has also, um, in other regards, looking at other countries, for instance, uh, the question of whether or not we should wear, uh, wear face masks, that has been uh, something that we've looked at, or the politicians and the journalists have looked at, for instance, how, how do the US uh, health authorities deal with this question? How, what does Fauci says? Um, stuff like that. So yeah, it's it's a lot of pressure, um, but also like this competitive um, dimension uh, with the Swedes and the Danes. And when the Danes beat us to lock down uh, the country, uh, the Danes were one day ahead. And that was also something that was used by journalists to criticize the Norwegian prime minister. Why didn't we lock down uh, faster? Stuff like that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Bengt, did you want to answer as well or comment? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. It's a really interesting one. Uh, as I said, my colleague has studied the media reports and, and it's quite, their conclusion is that we did compare with other countries and did a report about other countries, but most of the US and Italy and UK and so on were, were big disasters. Um, to some extent, the Nordic countries, but not that much. And uh, their conclusion is that they should actually, what the journalists should have done better is comparing with uh, the Nordic countries mm -hmm. than just comparing with uh, the rest of the world. Maybe due to, I don't know, maybe due to because it didn't happen that much in Norway and Denmark, but they had a lot of 
high rising death tolls in US and, and, and in Italy and, and other countries. But uh, maybe the Swedish journalists could have done a better job actually comparing the and using that as a benchmark mm -hmm. against the uh, on this Tegnell and others, but they try to, but he always claimed that, well, you can't really compare that. They maybe they have a second wave and so on. So this kind of rhetoric tried to uh, explain and also defend the, the, the Swedish strategy and the position. So uh, that's what you get when you when you ask him all the time that he tries to defend and said you can, can't really compare the different, different countries. Uh, we had the spread much e earlier than they had. Uh, they have a different system for elder care and so on. So um, there were comparisons and questions about it, but uh, maybe it could have done more. Yeah, thank you, Bengt. Uh, Mark, do you want to comment as well? Yes, please. Thank you for the question. Uh, I would say that television news mostly played into the fear narrative. So we had a lot of pictures from New York, and other pictures from Italy and Spain about how bad things were, mostly in the first part of months of, of, the, of the virus. But, but that, that, that was a lot in, in, in television. We do sort of uh, compete uh, individually with Norway, Sweden and Denmark, mostly from Denmark's point of view with Sweden. Uh, and we've had some, some border closures. We've closed the borders in Sweden. Sweden have closed the borders on us. So we sort of had some 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 tensions between the two countries, politically speaking, where where the Swedish strategy sometimes had been presented in Danish news media as sort of not the odd man out, but the wacko of uh, the North, uh, to put it sort of bluntly. But that has varied again from time to time during during the pandemic. Thank you so much. Uh, for, for the answers, uh, this is uh, something that uh, we here in Switzerland see compared to Germany uh, with all the decisions we have been about 10 days later, uh, always 10 days later than Germany and some uh, decisions we decided to follow the Swedish uh, approach. And uh, it was interesting uh, how this played out uh, in, in the media with uh, following this or that uh, approach and kind of uh, uh, patriotism was mentioned, uh, we are uh, the best or uh, we are very special and we do it in this way. And I think this will be a bit more intensive in the next uh, in the next time when we're talking about the vaccines or it, it has started already. Who is the champion? Who is how we communicate and who has trust in what? And But thank you so much. It has been a, a fantastic discussion and presentations. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Albena. I think we will move to Audra. Uh, you have an... Well, oh, and I just... Could, could, could I yeah, add I just, just one comment there? Sorry. Yeah, Sorry, Audra. Could I add just one comment to that? Uh, because what was asked for uh, this kind of um, patriotism in, in terms of both uh, public opinion and journalism, uh, also that the journalists have a problem when the public wants this kind of patriotism perspective because there's a big pressure from the audience to ad adopt to this uh, world championship of corona management, uh, which makes the journalists in terms of conflict in trying to scrutinize investigative reporting. And actually, when the, as, as uh, was it Marcus said, that the, the first critical reports in, in the news media against the government were criticized by the audience. And we saw the same stories when Anders Stegnell was criticized that people stand up for Anders Stegnell because you shouldn't criticize him. He's, a, he's our hero. So, and, and that might be the problem of trust, actually, uh, when it comes to trusting the authorities and politicians, that maybe we shouldn't trust them that much because that also undermines the possibility of uh, accountability. So that's another discussion that uh, uh, adds into this discussion that too much trust might not be a good thing. Thank you, Ben. Uh, I think now um, it's you. Yeah, Audra, uh, you have another question. Yeah, it was actually just a quick comment on that because in the UK, uh, Sweden was used as our counterpoint. So when we were wanting to lock down, um, Sweden was used as the counterpoint to why shouldn't 
why should the UK lock down? Look what Sweden's doing. We can be responsible like the Swedes. And then someone had to explain that there was a very fundamental difference between how Swedes behave in public in terms of trust in government and following recommendations versus how Brits do. So, I mean, it, the, the Swedish case was really the only one we heard too much about. Uh, okay, so here we have a question from Christian. Hello. Hello, how do you do? Um, well, um, uh, it's really nice to hear from all of you. Uh, you've all identified a high level of trust in, in our Scandinavian countries. And I think this question came in one of my classes in Volda. We're on the west coast of Norway, so that might play a part. Uh, I'm thinking a bit ahead about we, we hope to come into the kind of post uh, crisis phase uh, eventually. I guess that we like in some, it might be in Sweden and Denmark and Iceland and Finland also, but we see a dispute in Norway now about vaccine policies and, and, and how does this play in to support the crisis policies we've had? I mean, would the credibility hold uh, if we can't supply enough vaccines and, and this happens now following weeks and months and in, in the next way, phase that we go into starting on the post crisis phase, do you think um, you could, we could uphold this kind of crisis communication and uh, the inst institutional trust if, if something like uh, a dispute here on, on post on, on the vaccines is going on? Yes, Mark. I think that's a very good question and uh, I think Danish politicians, at least the Danish Prime Minister, is very well aware that we're always all, already behind the curve in Denmark and she's made a rather controversial visit to Israel, as you may know, a visit that from a, a, a citizen point of view came out of nowhere, it was in the newspaper. Prime Minister is going to Israel together with Austria to do something, something vaccine. It's extremely vague what the purpose uh, is. It's not clear what we get out of it, but at least it, it's, it's again a, a, a show of force and trying to take control of the situation in which she actually has no control because at the same time, we've just been told that the vaccine plan will now be three weeks late uh, according to the first plan. So, so the, she's definitely trying to take control and showing leadership but um, already she's failing if you look at the, the, the calendar because we are already three weeks uh, later than we were yesterday. Yes, yeah, Spain has uh, a comment on, on this or respond to the question. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting one because if, if they fail with the vaccination, with the vaccine, uh, vaccine program, I think there will be a, a deficit in trust. But I also see the tendency that it's also starting a blame game right now with who's to blame for, for the slow vaccine uh, vaccination. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have these regions in Sweden which are actually responsible for vaccination programs, not, the, not on the national level, but the regions. And in most big regions, large regions in Sweden, it's the political opposition on the national level that are actually rule, ruling these regions. So there's a blame game going on here who's actually responsible for if it's not successful. And I think well, there will be more blame games because it's, it's not that feeling of patriotism anymore. Now it's business as usual. This should be working. And no one is actually will be, uh, uh, I think there will be more, more politicians held account for not being successful when it comes to not being able to uh, fulfill the promises of, of uh, vaccination. Thank you, uh, Bent and Jenny. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I, I would agree with uh, Bent that uh, we see the same same kind of blame gaming in, in Finland, but but so far it's it's not against the government and their inability to get vaccine. It's it's against the the public authorities that's having really difficulties, you know, distributing the vaccine that we got. You know, people have to call 100 times to the to their health central to to book a time, and it's and so far it's been about 
it's been about the trust for how to distribute what we have and not really looking looking up to the highest political level but i'm sure we'll we'll get there too yeah thank you jenny and uh even you have something to say right yeah, always. always um well as christian knows uh in norway it's election year and that will definitely uh lead to more conflict so we've seen the initial consensus phase being broken up and people are playing the blame game and they will to a larger extent this year, I assume. Uh, but I would also say that to a certain extent, this is legitimate. I mean, it's politics, but also secondly, um, why weren't we better prepared? Uh, why didn't the politicians listen to the cautions being uh, or the urge, uh, the advice being given by the public health authorities? Why weren't better systems in place and so forth? Why were the politicians slashing the budget of the public health institute, for instance, in Norway, um, when they knew that uh, a pandemic would be a very likely uh, scenario? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I turn to you, Sofia. I think you have a <laughs> last question, right? Yeah, this is on a, on a, another note, but also tied to, to the blame game a little bit. But consistency is often regarded as the core value in crisis communication, sort of one voice, one message. Uh, and in Sweden, during the, the second phase of where we entered more of a critical blame game sort of period, uh, we could also see inconsistencies between the politicians and their mes mes uh, messages and the public health agencies and their messages. And I, I also, we, when we talked earlier, Mark, and during your presentation, you talked about government saying one thing and the public health authority saying another. And this, this inconsistency, I wonder what the effects, can you see effects on, on confusion on the individual level? Because trust is still very high, which makes this interesting. Does it have any effect, this inconsistency, and in, in how and can we see it in other countries? Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Irvin. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry for clinging to the, to the mic here. Um, I would say that uh, you will see in much literature, much of the literature, that it will insist on consistency. And uh, from the previous or from the uh, swine flu pandemic, yeah. we saw that this was brought up as well. We have to be consistent. This was the public health authorities were saying. But I think in this pandemic, at least the results from the Norwegian data goes to show that this is not necessarily the case. Uh, the public is able to uh, cope with inconsistencies. And again, uh, sorry for bringing this up all the time, harping about on about transparency, but I think being transparent about disagreements, be, being transparent about inconsistencies will actually uh, lead to more trust because people know that stuff, the world is messy, it's complicated. And this is something that the public can tackle to a large degree, I think. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, thanks for that that response. Uh, Mark, do you have a, a comment on it as well? Yes, I, I think that in Denmark, the fear narrative won to begin with. I, I think we were generally convinced that we were all going to die if we didn't do what we were told. Uh, and, and that lingered for a very long time. So, so people were actually legitimately afraid for a very long time and, un and insecure. And in that way, it was the one story of the two stories that won. The flip side of that is when people then don't die and you have more and more relevant questions, it becomes messier. And that's the situation where we're in now, where we have a lot of debate on both what we did and what we're going to do. And it's, it's much more messy now and there's no clear story, but there's also no clear political alternative because still the, the social democratic minority government do have a majority when it comes to the way they want to handle the pandemic. Very interesting. Thank you for for the answers. I, I, um, I, I, I really think it's it's interesting to discuss this matter of, of consistency. And since it's, uh, we can see it in the different cases as well, inconsistencies between different parties and what to do and how serious to take this this threat. So, so thank you a lot. Yeah. Uh, we have another question from Pavel. 
um, you are welcome to to pose it. The last question, I think, <laughs> for today. Yeah, uh, thank you. Just a brief question uh, connected to the issue of transparency and the one voice uh, issue. Can you comment on the use of uh, social media by the state crisis communication? Because we had several examples from from different countries. Uh, what's your uh, uh, evaluation? Do you think it worked or what were the problems with this? Yeah, Mark, you're, uh, I was just thinking because uh, I'm following uh, Danish Prime Minister on Instagram and I think she was really good at uh, using this tool with live streams with younger influencers trying to reach audiences. I think, uh, I, I don't know uh, your opinion about the issue, but I think she did a really good job at trying to uh, really use different tools how to communicate the message. As I'll just jump in, I agree with that. She's very, very good uh, at social media. And I think that she's been best, and I think the social health authorities have been best when they're trying to convey the message to younger people because they actually seem to try more. They seem to actually think much more about what works when you talk to younger people. When they talk to the general population, it becomes rather general and that's so specific and, and also without so many nuances and the, with generally very little humor, humor. There's empathy, but there's very little humor. And I think they sort of take the bite out of it when they, when they do the social media campaigns. Also, the videos from the Danish health authorities uh, have, have worked very well on that. I don't have any studies, but I think they've been very successful on that part. I think we're going to move to Jenny for the last comments of this webinar. Yeah, I, I, I read a study that uh, the use of social media in Finland has uh, has uh, become much more common during uh, the Corona pandemic and also for people at uh, the higher ages up to, to 90 uh, years, they still use uh, social media. But at the same time, we see that television has really also increased its importance during this crisis so it's and also for young people so it's not just so social media is important but it's it's really also at least in Finland been been the the TV and the, the, the age of the press conferences that we watch from home in the sofa thank you thank you Jenny and thank you everyone uh, Sofia yeah thank you everyone for for participating in this very interesting discussion and for the question posed by the audience. It's been very interesting to follow and I think this discussion has sparked new questions that we could discuss another time. Um, so thank you so much for participating in this in this uh, webinar on, on Scandinavian pandemic responses and unfortunately our time is, is up. <laughs> so we have to say goodbye but but I wish you all a nice weekend and, and it was fun to moderate this event together with Salman and hear all your interesting points and ideas. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And, and let me say just as mm -hmm. we go, thank you on behalf of the ACREA crisis communication section and also for Leeds Beckett um, as the hosts that this was really interesting and it was really nice to hear the discussion and, and I think a lot of the themes even though most of us live in countries that don't have such high levels of trust, I think a lot of the themes can be really applied beyond just uh, the, the Nordic countries as well. So it's been really useful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Have a nice weekend. Bye. Have